Now we want to look at connections between the ocean and the atmosphere, and particularly something called global teleconnections. Because the ocean and the atmosphere, as they interact with each other, they don't do all, always do so in ways that are immediately obvious. As it turns out, events in the equatorial Pacific can affect things happening in Europe and Africa. Processes in other locations can affect things that are going on in other oceans. And we call these global teleconnections. And some really good examples are both hurricanes and the phenomenon of El Nino and La Nina. Again, if you look in the inside front cover of your book, you'll see that the ocean and the atmosphere vary over space and time. And of course, variations of the ocean and the atmosphere over time and even over space are referred to as climatological variability, variability of the climate of the ocean and the atmosphere. Again, as we think about it, the ocean and atmosphere, and as we study climate and study the climate of the ocean and the atmosphere, we realize that they really don't vary independently. They're really like a series of seesaws going up and down. Sometimes they're synchronous, sometimes they counteract each other. If you think about swings, children swinging on a, in a playground, sometimes their swings are going opposite each other, sometimes they're swinging together. And the ocean and the atmosphere are the same way as well. The cycles of climate in the ocean and the atmosphere are sometimes enhancing each other and sometimes counteracting each other. And we'll have a really good example here in a few minutes of our current La Nina, which is being made worse in a sense by a 20 to 30 year cycle called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which has put our sea surface temperatures or our ocean temperatures in the Eastern Pacific a little bit colder. And so here's an example of two climate swings enhancing each other's effects. But we'll get to those details in just a minute. These connections, as I said before, are called global teleconnections. And two really good examples of it are both hurricanes, intense tropical cyclones whose winds exceed 74 miles per hour, that is the definition of a hurricane, and El Nino and La Nina. And really El Nino in some ways is the poster child of global teleconnections, as we'll find out. It turns out that even though this is largely a phenomenon that happens in the equatorial Pacific, El Nino, it really has implications for weather worldwide. And it turns out that even hurricanes are affected by El Nino. El Ninos tend to reduce the frequency of hurricanes at formation in the North Atlantic. La Nina is just the opposite. So let's take a little look at that. But first, let's start with hurricanes. Again, remember a cyclone. Remember low pressure. Remember as that air comes in and twists to the right, in the northern hemisphere, it causes a counterclockwise type circulation, what we call cyclonic circulation. That circulation creates what's called a tropical cyclone. And to define that, we just call it an independently rotating low pressure system with organized convection, convection being the heat driven movements of fluids occurring over tropical or subtropical water. So that's the official definition of a hurricane. A tropical cyclone is good enough, but you should also think about the subtleties of these details. Hurricanes largely originate in the eastern tropical North Atlantic, but let's not be fooled. We also get hurricanes in the Pacific Ocean as well. In fact, we get more hurricanes in the Pacific Ocean. We don't hear about them as often, A, because many of them dissipate before they interact with land, and B, because we just don't pay that much attention to hurricanes happening in Australia and Indonesia and China, even though we've had some very severe hurricanes in those areas of the world over the past several years. So it's just sort of our lack of attention to anything that's right under our nose that kind of makes us not think about cyclones or what are called typhoons in the Pacific Ocean. But in fact, we do get hurricanes. And hurricanes actually also in the, in the Eastern Pacific, where we live, create waves oftentimes. Uh, and when we have a hurricane down in Baja or off the coast of Mexico, it's usually some pretty good surfing or can be some pretty good surfing. So even though we're focusing here on North Atlantic hurricanes, let's not forget we have them in the Pacific Ocean as well. Okay, because hurricanes form off the coast of Africa or in the Caribbean, again, in the Eastern Tropical North Atlantic, 
and they move westward, they're affected by the Coriolis effect, so they, that brings them up to regions along the Caribbean or along the east coast of Mexico or into the Gulf of Mexico or into the eastern United States. And here's an interesting fact. Until the year 2004, there had never been a hurricane reported in the South Atlantic Ocean. 2004 changed that. Now, although individual hurricanes cannot be attributed to global warming because we're talking about hurricanes, which are a weather phenomenon, and global warming, which is a climate phenomenon, an increase in intensity and even an increase in the distribution or an expansion of the distribution of hurricanes is consistent with what should happen on a globe that is warming. Because as we'll find out, hurricanes are fueled by warmer water. And if warmer water is expanding, then the region of the ocean over which hurricanes can form is expanding. So although this is a surprise that we have in 2004, the first hurricane ever reported in the South Atlantic, it's not inconsistent with, and it is consistent with, the type of warming that we've seen in our planet over the last hundred years. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Hurricane season, here's just some details, uh, is typically the period from June 1st to November 30th. Hurricanes are actually given names when they reach tropical storm strength. Tropical storm strength is winds in excess of 39 miles per hour. They're actually named according to a pre-prepared list of names and they, they list names, 21 different names uh, for each letter of the alphabet or for most letters of the alphabet uh, for six years ahead of time. After six years, the names repeat. So the World Meteorological Society, uh, I believe this is organization, uh, the WMO, got together and decided to use, pre to use men's and women's names Previous to 1979, only women's names were used. Let's hear a hurrah for women's lib. Men should have be hurricanes too. And the history of namings is, it's kind of an aside, but it's kind of interesting because there were many reports of uh, wealthy princes um, who were not very happy about a particular princess wanting the World Meteorological Organization to name a hurricane after their uh, not-so-happy princess or the princess that they were kind of mad about or pissed off at. So people sending in, please name it Hurricane Fred because I'm mad at Fred or please call it Hurricane Linda because she divorced me and took all my money. So there's lots of interesting sort of anecdotal stories related to the naming of hurricanes, but the World Meteorological Organization has really put their foot down and decided here's the 21 names that we're going to use, 21 different names for six years at a time, and then after that we'll repeat the names. And what happens if there's more than 21 hurricanes, as there was in 2005? Well, we go to Greek letters, and the Greek alphabet is used. And actually in 2005, four storms were given Greek alphabet names. So we actually had a Hurricane Alpha and a Hurricane Beta and a Hurricane Gamma. Strange, isn't it? Why don't they just use more names?